Hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionHydration.com. Precision Hydration offer electrolyte drinks in different strengths to match how you sweat. Personalize your hydration strategy today at PrecisionHydration.com and get a free box or tube of pH worth up to $9.99 using the code Oxygen Addict. We're also brought to you by FoodCell.co.uk. The next generation of top tube nutritional carriers for your bike, designed to allow endurance triathletes and cyclists to carry enough food and gels while allowing easy access. Check it out at foodcell.co.uk. And we're also brought to you by teamoxygenatic.com triathlon coaching. Helping hundreds of age group triathletes see huge improvements in their 70.3 and Ironman performances. The time training system makes sure that you get the important training done each week in a way that complements the rest of your life. And all right, everybody, welcome to the show. This week, we have got results for you from the Outlaw Full Distance in Nottingham, Ironman Hamburg, Lake Placid and Canada. And Hells, we've also got a brilliant interview with Sarah Piampiano, who's just finished second in Hamburg. So the interview was done the week leading up to that. Um, but like, look great at that. Timing. We managed great timing. Yeah, she's she's awesome, actually. It's a very interesting interview. So if you've ever wondered whether it's possible to go from working a 100-hour week in corporate banking and smoking two packs of cigarettes a day to the very highest level of triathlon, this is the interview for you. How are you doing, Hells? Have you have you thawed out and dried out a bit after the weekend? It was, it was a bit nuts, wasn't it? It was rather bonkers. Yeah. So going from what did we have like high 30s. So I did a a 5k on Thursday evening in uh, I don't even know what it was like. It was really hot, really hot. Mental Um, hot, wasn't it? Yeah, mental hot on Thursday in the UK for us very much so so i don't know it yeah mid 30s high 30s wasn't it for sure high 30s and then still. in the evening probably for that 5k oh, i don't know i we went onto the track and did like a a warm up lap and thought oh blimey this is rather toasty um yeah it was quite interesting uh, yeah. and then you know saturday and sunday it just chucked it down and yesterday could not have been more different to Thursday and um, Rich and I were working at the Sulphur Triathlon. We were, uh, uh, I don't know, team leaders on the run course and we were there in our full waterproofs, waterproof trousers, waterproof coat, yeah. like Gore-Tex shoes and then pon- we had the poncho look going on and, and it was even just, with that, it's still... Oh, absolutely soaking and, yeah. and any time I went to sort of put... I had gloves someone had to yeah. come and bring me gloves because they're like you get cold hands get these yeah. gloves on you yeah. my lips were turning blue they were like get some coffee in you Helen <laughs> <laughs> and um and it was 15 degrees so you know 20 degrees cooler over the space of two or three days and in the northwest of England in particular this weekend and obviously in Nottingham as we're about to hear um I mean they the, the rain was insane so other parts of the country have been bone dry but here we've had a month's worth of rainfall in in a day it's hard it's hard to describe i mean saying it rained hard it doesn't do it justice it was like a tropical storm it was just yeah. just absolutely bonkers i was down at the outlaw in nottingham and um do you know what else first up why don't we play Let's do this like in sequential time order because on the Saturday it wasn't very nice, but it was just raining. And like you said, yeah. it was fifteen degrees. wasn't It didn't feel like it was fifteen degrees because it was like that humid, cold feeling. And I was like you; I had two fleeces on, a full set of waterproofs, and we were <laughs> at the expo meeting people and you know calming nerves down and stuff. And it was that sort of people were saying. I'm thinking of just racing in a tri suit. What should I do? And it was like, you need to stay warm. You're going to be out there for six hours on the bike. You need to put something else on to stay warm. It's <laughs> as much as I extol the virtues of being as aerodynamic and fast as possible. It's riding in a rain jacket weather, you know, yeah. be sensible. Yeah. Um, and we were like, well, you know, it stopped raining for a bit, started again. And we started saying, you know what, if it stays like this, it actually could be perfect racing weather. It's perfect mm. for the marathon. It's pretty cool and you might get a bit of a shower over you. So coming towards the end of the day, just about five o'clock, I was having a chat with Ian, the race organizer, and David Bishop walked by. 
who a lot of yeah. you all know, he's Tom Bishop's twin brother. He's obviously raced at a very high level back in sort of 2015, 16. I think he finished second elite at London. Um, and he's had, you know, a whole bunch of really good results. But then the last year in particular, he's been he's been really badly injured and he's had horrible health problems. So for him, it was like back to racing. I'm in great shape. And he was due to be at Racing Challenge Prague and the airline cancelled his flight the day before. So oh, he was literally like, what am I going to do? Are there any races I can do? Decides, do you know what? Why not see if I can race the Outlaw? So we've got a few minutes of interview with him here. He'll tell his own little story. All right, so first interview we've got is with David Bishop, who's a surprise. Like, it doesn't get any more last-minute entry than this, does it really? We are 10 to 5 on the day before the race. Tell us the story behind you entering then. Well, I'd originally planned to race Challenge Prague, but uh, unfortunately my flight got cancelled and was there sort of messing around a bit. So, yeah, I couldn't get out there in time. I uh, was looking at races to do and I've always known about Outlaw and, yeah, wanted to do it. And I thought, you know what, why not? So this will be, be your first full iron distance race and you were training for 70.3. That's quite a big bite of the apple to go for as an upgrade, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, um, I've done four um, 70.3 or challenge ra- half distance races this year. I did two uh, a week after another, so that's like pretty much an Ironman. So yeah, I thought, why not? <laughs> I love it. I've got to say, you just been saying before we went on air, you've been training a lot with Will Clark in Loughborough, and he's giving you some tips for tomorrow. So what do you think you've got in store for you, stepping up from the half distance to the full distance? Uh, yeah, I've trained with Will for well, years and years now. We're both based at Loughborough University. Um, yeah, he's, he's giving me some sort of insider tips. In fact, I, I gave him a call and say, what, do you think this is a smart thing to do or do you think I'm just being a bit of an idiot? Uh, but he said, no, uh, as long as you get it right, get the fuel in right, get the pace in right, then I, I should be okay. Uh, so I'm just going to yeah, listen to his advice and sort of go from there and just see, see how it goes, really. Um, yeah, I'm quite excited. I thought I'd be very nervous, but I am really excited, so... Yeah, yeah, looking forward to it. So in terms of training the lead up to this, and obviously swimming's never really an issue for you elite guys, but in terms of sort of long bikes and long runs, what's the sort of longest distance you've been up to in training leading up to this? Oh, there's a smile there. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Yeah, I would never, I've never ran the distance ever. Uh, Bike the distance maybe a handful of times. Um, But I think the emphasis on training has changed a lot in long distance in recent years. I remember 10 years ago looking at some of the training volumes, some of the long distance guys, and there's rumours of like 45, 50, even apparently Terenzo Brazone or whatever did a 60 hour week, which is just stupid. Whereas a lot of the guys now only train 25 to 30 hours. Uh, Chatting with uh, Tim Donnell, also based in Loughborough, and and Will, they're ready. Oh, and yeah, Dave McNamee as well, like all around 25 hours a week. So it's not necessarily about volume, it's about consistent hard sessions and getting the power right, getting that sort of thing right. So I've done that because I've had to for Century Point 3, so uh, I just have to knock the power down a bit and just be okay with riding at that uncomfortable pace. Yeah. Okay, and so of all the three disciplines, which is the one that you're most excited about tomorrow? Um, the run. I, the weather is going to be raining most of the day, so the bike's going to be pretty miserable. But uh, I heard the course is really good, so I, I guess I'm excited about that. But I'm just excited to get onto the run and see how my legs feel. And I know the crowds will be good around around the venue here. And yeah, I, I, the first time I completed a half, I was quite emotional. At the end, I was well, I was like really proud, like as as much so as like winning London Try or doing well in ITU races. I was really proud for like com- completing it. So I'm sure if I'm able to get to the end, then yeah, I'm, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be pretty pretty happy about that. Awesome. Well, listen, we wish you all the best. Go and uh, sit yourself down in the race briefing and hopefully we'll catch up with you tomorrow after your event and, um, yeah, see how the emotions are flowing then. Oh, wicked. Thanks a lot. So how about that then? No no specific training, not particularly any long rides done, no long runs done. Yeah, I'll go and do an Ironman. I'll go and jump in. Five to five the day before the race when, you, when you're registering. So it was, like, super exciting because, obviously, like, really fit guy, who knows how well he's going to go. He's obviously proven over the 70.3, but even he's got no idea how he's going to go over the iron distance. <laughs> he's had advice from Will Clark to say, well, kind of ride at this kind of power and remember to eat and you'll be fine, kid, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so I was really excited to see how he's going to go because like three options, he's going to have a pretty okay race. 
he's going to have an absolutely storming debut performance and all of a sudden we've got a new young gun on the Iron Man scene or he's going to completely detonate and just have yep. a miserable time. Either way, from my personal selfish point of view, really exciting to watch how this is going to play out. But yeah, yeah. fast forward to the next morning. So we go down for the swim start and five minutes before the race, it's very dark and overcast. Just as all the swimmers are in the water, they did this really cool thing where there was like a volunteer with, like he had a, a great big bin and a stick and he was beating it like a drum and everyone Brilliant. was chanting in the water. It was really cool. And then it started to rain. And within a minute of it starting to rain, it was raining so hard. All the spectators just forgot the race were going to happen and were just running for cover. Oh it was God. like a tropical storm. Oh. And by the time Andy and I found shelter under a tree and watched the swim go off, and five minutes later, by the time we walked across transition to get under one of those garagey things at the back, transition yeah. was an inch deep in water in five minutes of rain. Like that's... You almost couldn't see across the lake through the rain. It was just <gasps> mental. So we stood there going, you know, initially it's like, oh, this is awful for the riders. Mm. And within 20 minutes, you were just going, it hasn't eased up. Like, really, can you can you actually do a race in this? There's, yeah, yeah. Like, just like we couldn't, you couldn't walk outside of this garage thing we were in to get to a portaloo because you were going to be soaked to the bone, even with Gore-Tex on. It was just mental. So within... It must have been, it was before the first swimmer came out of the water. So like half an hour after this, yeah, all of the marshals were phoning up the organizer to say, like, there's trees come down on the course. This road oh. is now two inches oh, underwater. No. This is impassable. This roundabout's underwater at one point. And like, you've got to cancel the bike leg because like, it's just literally, yeah, and I'm, I'm not overstating it. It's an inch deep in, tra in transition on that concrete base within five minutes of it starting raining. So yeah, it was just nuts. I've never, I honestly have never seen where the so light came. How did they came. manage that then with everyone had already started to swim? Well, what they did was they, they put a thing out over um, obviously to all the volunteers. And at this point we'd gone over, we kind of legged it through the rain to the main building to try and like get a coffee. And at this point we were still thinking the bike was going to go on somehow. Um, mm. And we heard this rumor that they were going to cancel the bike leg. So the marshals just told all the athletes as they got out of the water that um, that, this were, that the bike's been cancelled, and they kept them in the transition tents. And they said we're going to we're going to start the marathon at nine o'clock. And they did it like in a it was really well organized. Actually, it was it was done in like a time trial start every five seconds. Yeah. So off they all went because obviously because it's set up for a triathlon, you can't send all the runners off together because you've got like what you might have 20 volunteers on an aid station, but they can't deal with a thousand people coming yeah, no, through no. like a massive marathon could. Um, so yeah. So yeah. So it's just booted down and the marathon, you know, the marathon was ankle deep in water. So anybody who, anybody who completed that just hats off to them. Cause it, like it was horrible just running from the garage to get to the coffee shop thing. It was beastly. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. was it, did the, did the, was it wanging it down throughout the whole of the marathon as well? Throughout the whole of the day. Yeah. It oh. it didn't stay that kind of mental tropical storm kind of yeah. feeling, but yeah. it rained hard the whole day. Like wherever you went, you were, you were running to try and get to the next place. And then a couple of times it got even heavier and you were just like, this is insane. Ugh. Even, even like trying to drive out the campsite at the end of the day. The van mm. wheels were spinning on the grass. I was like, "Oh, and now, you know, now I'm going to get stuck in the in the campsite kind of thing." It was bonkers. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So. That is... I I did think yesterday at Salford. So Salford had a sprint and they had standard distance racing going on. Yeah. And I just seriously hats off to anybody who actually even started because yeah. <laughs> the temptation would have been, "I'm just going to stay in bed this morning." Um, yeah. it was just. It was horrible. It was. It was like once in a like well, once in a year's weather, wasn't it? Once in a lifetime weather in, in yeah. both places. And yeah. again, like you said, the weird thing is, other parts of the country are just having a. They must be hearing the news that it's cancelled and think, what's going on? Yeah. No, my friend sent me a photo of um of her family at the beach down in Devon. 
Just unreal, <laughs> really gorgeous <isn't> <laughs> weather. Yeah. Quite nice. <laughs> yeah. I didn't hear, like, here's how mental it was. I literally didn't hear a single athlete or family member there complaining that they'd cancelled the bike course. Everyone was just like, yeah, we get it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, wow. it was bonkers. And like hats off to the organisers because I'm, I'm sure everyone's got like a contingency for what if, but I've never heard of a bike leg on a race being cancelled before. You hear of swims being cancelled, but. Or like at that last, that yeah. so late. Yeah. yeah. After so the Zell swims Zell Zell are set Zay, off. Yeah, Zell Amzai turned into a. Um, That's oh, right, what did that yeah. turn into? That turned into it something snowed, because again it, it during the yeah during the swim. and so they again had to think yeah, yeah yeah but yeah this was um I really do think wow given that everyone was was already in the water and the race had already started yeah yeah to then just, come up with a plan B that's yeah pretty yeah. impressive to keep everyone safe so anyone who did get out and race in that I think hats off to you it was bonkers um so a little bit of results in from the outlaw ended up being a swim run. Um, overall individual winner was David Bishop in the end. I think he swam low fifties and he ran a two forty four. It turned into a really good run race actually because both him, Carl Jones in second, and Barnaby Palmer in third all ran low two forty four marathons. So it was it was seriously fast running out there. Given that mm-hmm. you know, given that a lot of the run course was literally ankle deep in water, mm-hmm. the video clips I saw from around there. Like, just mental. Good. Yeah, really good. Yeah. And then yeah. the ladies' side, it was won by Eleanor Wiseman with Naomi Shinkins in second and Sarah Cole in third. Great. Yeah, good stuff. All right, so that was results from um, from the Outlaw. We've already heard that little interview with David that we grabbed. Hopefully, Hells will manage to get him on for a get him on for a full interview sometime over the next couple of weeks. Right, let's move around the world, shall we? Because racing over in Germany, we had Ironman Hamburg going on. We did, we did. We did have Ironman Hamburg and we had a fantastic win for Susie Cheatham in just under nine hours, 8.58. She crossed the line. She's did a one-hour swim. Her bike split, Rob, I know she's been working with Matt Bottrell, 4.46 on the bike, which yeah. is fantastic. Still and then she ran a 3.03 off the bike. So brilliant to see her and you could see afterwards um you know like matt bottles just really delighted with the the sort of team effort the improvement and everything so yes chapeau to susie cheatham for that one ahead of sarah piampiano who we will hear from shortly in nine hours who and she ran a 256 marathon off the bike which again to like to put it in context fastest men's run of the day was 254 so she's just such an incredible runner she talks Mm. about this in her interview how she just loves chasing people down and she Mm. loves absolutely drilling it and again she didn't have she's not the strongest swimmer in the pro pack she swam six minutes slower than Susie but she biked 450 so she was only three minutes down on on Susie and we know like the effort Susie's gone to and the work with Matt that she's done on the bike so Sarah's bike run combination is absolutely deadly so yeah. uh yeah great result yeah. for her as well julia gager was third in that race and then in the men's race christian hoggenhaug of denmark was the winner in eight hours and 11 and as you said he did he was the fastest runner of the day in the men's side as well with the 254 rudy Wild was second 816 and then paul schuster of germany was third now down in france we had the alpe d'huez long course race which you know is just an incredible and awesome race because you get to ride up Alpe d'Huez and then even more bonkers the run entirely takes place at I think the base station there from memory is 16 or 1700 meters up in the air so like Mm. proper altitude so to do the run leg up there all around through the mountains on kind of fire roads it must be hideous I lived there when I was 21 for a Mm. ski season and I really clearly remember trying to go out for a jog the first week I was there <laughs> and just being like, I've only got one lung. This is ridiculous. Yeah. How yeah. people yeah. run up there when they're not acclimated is beyond me. Um, so on the men's side, fantastic win for Roman Guillaume. He's a super tiny, skinny little climber and he had an amazing ride where he drilled it on the bike on the climb up Alpe d'Huez. He was ahead of Albert Moreno and 
Kenneth, oh, good grief, Van Driessen of Belgium in third. But arguably the performance of the day was the women's winner, wasn't it? Daniela Reef. Yeah, she actually outbiked Romain Guillaume up Alpe d'Huez. So by sort of, what, 20 seconds? Yeah. She did 55 minutes it took her to get up Alpe d'Huez. She actually went past him. There's some video footage of her just going past. And yeah, it's pretty, um, pretty some, it's something. So if you can yeah. um, go and watch the video, you're just like, blimey, that is um, incredible riding. Not um, and that, she... I don't know if you realise this, but she actually crossed the line first. So yes, the, the women got the... a, was it like a 10 minute head start? I think 15, I think. 15 minute head start. So Roman mm-hmm. Guillaume had caught her on the bike, overtaken her. And then she took him back on Alpe d'Huez and put enough time into him that she stayed in front on the run. She was sixth overall in the whole race. So only five men finished ahead of her. And she had a 30 minute margin of victory over Carrie Lester in second. Yep. 30 minutes. Alexandra Fondeur. Yeah. Mad, isn't it? It's it's staggering. Yeah. Female pros around the world must be looking at her performances and just going, what do we do? How do you... Yeah, what do you have to do? How do you match that? Mentally, how do you prepare to go out and race someone who's putting performances like this out during the season? Mm. Yeah. Because someone like Roman Guillaume, do you remember when he came in race time in the UK the first time? And he was so far ahead of everybody. He's this tiny little... You know, he's built like a, a Tour de France Alpine climber to yeah, outclimb yeah. him on the bike. And he likes, you know, cycling and hilly courses and stuff. That's his strong point, yeah. isn't it? It's not like it's a, it's not like it's a, he's a B-series pro. There's probably not many people in the world better than him at climbing in terms of triathlon for a yeah. course like that. It's just, I don't think we can overstate what an amazing performance Daniel Reef has put in there. No, no. Oh, I, I'm sure Roman Guillaume is... Um, I'm sure he's coming back to Wales. Yeah, he's on the start list again for Wales this year. That'll suit him perfectly, won't it? Yeah, he's. he's I think he's been. He came after Bolton, didn't he, that year? Because he crashed yeah, out. That's right. And then, yeah. yeah, and then he didn't have a great race in Wales either. So fingers crossed for this time. Absolutely. So, a couple of other races that happened around the world. Then we also had Ironman Lake Placid. That was it was a male pro race only. So that's. One of the longest standing, it was originally Ironman USA, wasn't it? When they only had one race Mm. in America. So I think, was it like the 25th or 30th anniversary race or something like that? It's been been a long time. So a win for Matt Russell. Um, He took it out in 827 ahead of Joe Gambles and Mark Juleson in third. And then in Canada, it was Ironman Canada and it was the women's pro race only. So no male pros in Canada. And it was won by Heather Wirtel ahead of Jen Annett and Kelsey Withrow. But interestingly, and I think we've seen this previously, Heather Wirtel, she raced Ironman Wales last year. She is probably going to be declining her Kona slot. And there were two on offer, which means that Jen Anna and Kelsey Withrow will probably get those and be going to Hawaii. Last race there as well in Whistler. It looks like the locals have had enough of uh, the. It's a strange time of year to hold it. All the local press that I read sort of said, have it in the spring or in the autumn when all the hotels are empty. Awesome. Mm-hmm. But mm. it comes in and it blocks up the town. Apparently, Whistler's got one road in and out and. All the local businesses like, effectively, we don't make any money at all on this day because no one can get in to buy anything. Mm. So so it's they're not going to be sad to see it go from the local press I've seen. And it's heading back to Penticton. Yeah, and Penticton seemed delighted to be getting it back, I think. Yeah. And everyone's very excited by that. And it's sold out already for next year. Oh, I within, didn't know that. Yeah, it, it's pretty it, – it, I'm really sure that it has sold out. I read that this week, I'm sure. Yeah. Awesome yeah. stuff. Yeah. There you go. Good, 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 good. All right. Give me a second here because my computer health is spinning the wheels in the background. Oh, that's good. We like we like it when we get the the ball of doom. <laughs> yeah, Ironman Canada sold out in in less than twenty four hours. Did it really? Yeah, yeah. So, round about I don't know yeah, two and a half thousand. Super, athletes. super um, popular, wasn't it? Back in the day, it was one of those. It's one of those like iconic end of summer 
one loop on the bike, which I don't think there's many courses left like that. Mm. We go out and there's a couple of amazing mountain passes and you know, it's always on my list of I really fancy doing that. What, Penticton? Yeah. I used to yeah, read just... one of my like one of my heroes as I started racing was a, an age group called Gordo Byrne who became a pro and ended up finishing second at Penticton. And he mm. was a prolific blogger who one of those guys who would write a really good blog every week and you could follow his train and he went from, you know, just a, an age grouper who got into triathlon to basically finishing second was his peak performance and he was less than a minute off the win and he'd punctured and he ran a 246 marathon to run the guy down. So it was like, I remember following his blog week in, week out thinking, oh, is he going to get to win it? So yeah, I felt like virtually I'd done the race year after year just by following Gordo's blog. <laughs> you should put it on your long, maybe maybe for a big birthday, Rob, in a couple of years, put it on there. Do you know, Hells, I remembered the other day, and I don't know how you forget do this. Do you remember I did Triathlon X back in yep. 2016? Yeah. I found something I'd written in my diary, and I wrote, <gasps> up on top of the mountain when that storm came in, I made mm. a deal with God to get me down safely and I'd never do another Iron Man. Right, there you go. And right. I was like, hmm, maybe I should stick to that. <laughs> I was um I when I was cheering on here. when I was cheering on yesterday, it was funny actually, because I was going for it in the cheering on stakes to the point that um a German <laughs> tourist genuinely got his phone out and started filming me because I think he thought that I was, well, a lunatic, an absolute lunatic. It's no news and, to me, Helen. And uh, <laughs> and he said, "No, it's it it is motivating." Love it. It's like, oh my god. Anyway, I was cheering on with a, another woman who I said, "Look, I'm really sorry. I do get a little bit carried away." And she said, "No, it's great. You've got to get behind these. You know, you've got to get behind them." So when her daughter would come round, we'd be like banging and whistling, and she was loving it as well. But she did say, I really wish, you know, I, I really wish that my daughter wouldn't do Iron Man. And, um, and we were having then a little chat about, I said, yeah, my mum's the same. Like, I think she's like, could you maybe just do like a half or something? Um, you really feel for think... the spectators when you're at an event and you watch how long they've got to sit around for. And and also know. like, the, I think the worry as well. Yeah. 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 I get it. <laughs> Right, listen, shout out to our sponsors, Food Cell. I got to hang out with Mark from Food Cell for a good while over the weekend because he very kindly let me shelter underneath his gazebo <laughs> as the yeah. rain was bouncing down. It was great for sales for him because people kept coming over to the gazebo to get out the rain and would be convinced to buy one while they were there. Oh, that's clever. That's it good. Was, it was great. So it was dead nice actually to meet so many podcast listeners at the race. They came over and one came to Mark and said, I feel like I've been brainwashed by the podcast into buying one of these things because he keeps saying how good they are every week. So I'm going to have one. So that was awesome. Uh, so Food Cell it is a top tube nutritional carrier. They've got little bolt holes that bolt to the top of your bike if you've got them. And if not, they've got really clever Velcro straps to strap it on. And it means you can carry four of those big fat gels or two big chunks of flapjack or even your spares kit in a nice aerodynamic way as you're riding. Plus, you can open it and close it with one finger as you're riding to get stuff into and out of it, which almost has been impossible with the other top tube carriers. If you're racing long distance, you definitely need some way of carrying your spares kit and or of carrying nutrition. That means you can get to it easily and quickly. So I don't think there's a better solution on the market than food cell. And Mark's a super nice guy as well, which is also a good reason to buy stuff, isn't it? Designed and produced yes. from the UK. So they've reduced the price by five pounds to thirty nine ninety nine, and there's a competition on at the moment. You can win a free entry to Outlaw X, which is taking place at Thorsby Park in Nottingham on Sunday, the twenty second of September. If you buy a food sale between now and the seventh of August, twenty nineteen, so check the box at checkout to be entered into the free draw. So yeah, that was good. Got to hang out with them. Uh, we had a real laugh actually. He was next door to the guys from um, Pelotan Sun Cream, who. Had a great day. Poor Tom was just like, every time we put out a press release about it being sunny, <gasps> the rain closes in. <laughs> really? Oh, no. Oh, oh no. you got a feel for him, haven't you? It was awful. Yes. That would not have been the day for it yesterday. He's just like, we can't even give it away. People aren't interested when it's like this. <laughs> so, oh, oh, bless. But 
all good fun hells it's all good fun yeah. you get to the end of it and like there was there was us the peloton guys the food cell guys there was a bunch of guys from rose bikes we were all just like sheltering under this gazebo trying to watch a bit of the tour on saturday on an ipad just like, oh. this is like being in you know survive you just this. Laugh. It's a brotherhood at the end of it <laughs> yeah yeah i did i did yes i did get to the point of just laughing yesterday because if you don't laugh you'll yeah. cry won't you yeah totally just like this is bonkers all right coach's couch this week we're gonna we're gonna wrap up the the race review document and i was hoping this would tie in really nicely with like a review of after outlaw for people because we're going to talk about how to analyze your run but a lot of the stuff on our race review document is it's all about analyzing your run in view of how your bike leg has gone so it isn't going to tie in that nicely really with with the outlaw but we'll go through it anyway hells and we'll have a little check so I think the key is you, as a listener, you can download this race review document from the link in the show notes. And the idea is you analyze your race shortly after you've done it to sort of honestly review what you did, whether what you did was like what you planned to do. So the first thing to review with your run was what was your confidence in your run fitness and ability leading into it? What was your run result relative to what your expectation was? And here I think, have a look at what your splits were if you've taken them on your watch or used Garmin Connect or whatever. Have a look what your run pacing actually did during the run, whether it was even paced, because sometimes it feels like it is, but your pace drops off at certain points. Then make a list of any major contributing factors, either positive or negative, to your run performance. So obviously Outlaw yesterday is booting down with rain and your ankle deep in water. That's going to skew your result if you've got sore, wet, blistered feet the whole way around. But things like heat, cramp, pacing, hills, soreness, get it all down on paper. Make a list of your nutrition and your hydration, how much you drank, how much you ate, what you actually took in and compare it to what you planned to do, how you felt at the halfway point of the run. And then the key bit here for sort of long distance triathlon performance is Looking back on how you felt from the halfway point of the run onwards, do you still feel that your bike pacing was appropriate to allow you to run well? Because often if you've got to that like 25k point in the the outlaw marathon and you just detonated and you can't run at all, part of the solution might be actually I felt all right on the bike, but I was clearly riding too hard and I need to adjust that for next time. So That's how to go through your run and review it and then check it against your bike pacing at the end of it. So download that and have a look at it. If at the end of it, you've not had the race that you feel like you've deserved or expected. I'm a bit busy this week, actually, because I'm away on holiday at the end of the week. So I've just got one slot available. You can click the link in the show notes and I'll hopefully have a review with a listener on Skype about the race and how it's gone. Um, and we're just going to play a quick minutes testimonial from Team Oxygen Addict Anthony de Kirk from the Netherlands to tell you about his experience in Team Oxygen Addict. I just finished my uh, Exterra Belgium, a very tough race. I'm really, it was really hard, but in the end I finished it and I thought it would be a great moment to make a bit of a testimonial for our Team Oxygen Addict. Because if I couldn't have done this and the other half distances I've did in the past uh, period without them. Uh, when I started three years ago, I needed a coach because I was a very uh, busy with my work. I didn't have any experience, so I looked around and I ended up with uh, Rob. And Rob is a great guy. It's very easy because you get your training through training peaks. You can adjust if needed. And what's also great is the Facebook interface, the Team Oxygen Addict private group. Because you can ask Rob anything you want and he will reply really quickly on that. And the bonus there is there are a lot of other people in the group as well. So people who who are reading messages, sharing ideas and doing stuff. So that's also great because it gives it, it gives, it makes you part of a team. And it's fun to read race reports, tips, experiences and see each other in the call. So yeah, I'm happy I joined uh, Oxygen Addict and I think it's a great uh, solution because if especially if you're time constrained it's very easy you don't need to, to spend much time because Facebook covers you Rob is quick so I would say if you need a coach time constrained or not go for him why not join us I uh, hope to see you quickly on Facebook all right so great stuff from Anthony and his performance at Xterra was pretty cool so I think Hells it's time to move on to our interview of the week with Sarah Piampiano isn't it Yes, it would be great to hear from her. 
yeah, she's just had this awesome result, finishing second at Hamburg. So we've got a cracking review with her here of, if you remember back at Ironman Brazil, she did a 4.43 on the bike there and then backed her with a 2.53 marathon. So dead interesting backstory about how she used to be a crazy overworked banker and then came back to athletics and triathlon later in life. So here's this week's interview of the week with Sarah Piampiano. Sarah Piampiano, it's lovely to have you back on the show. How are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me. I've got to say, you look you look very brown and healthy. Um, I'm <laughs> sitting here in the driving rain in England at the moment. So. I don't think being in Hamburg is helping me at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's the weather broken. For that. It, well, I'm in Germany a couple of weeks ago was just, it was mental. It was like 45 degrees centigrade or something. So has that kind of passed over now in Germany? I mean, since I've been here, it's been quite chilly. I've been wearing running tights and long sleeve shirts and leg warmers and arm warmers and gloves and vests, you know, when I've been biking and running. So it's, um, it's been pretty chilly, but I think, uh, starting next week, it's supposed to get quite hot, not like Frankfurt was, but, um, it'll probably be like 30, which is pretty warm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Says... Yeah, it's crazy. Welcome to Europe, I guess. You can have, you know, if you don't like the <laughs> yeah. weather, just wait around a couple of days and you'll have a whole new set of have come along. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. So we had you on the show. I was looking back. It was January of 2017. Um, you have a pretty amazing story about your path into triathlon. So I want to start by by asking you about that really. For Our, our show has grown massively since then, so loads of listeners won't have heard your story. Um, it's easy to sit here and assume that people racing at the highest level of pros had this kind of, they trained as a kid and they always trained in college and they always were athletic. Your story in triathlon is very different to that, isn't it? And involves hundred hour weeks in a bank and smoking two packs a day. So this might provide a little bit of inspiration for change for people listening, I think. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, by background, I did grow up with a, with quite an athletic background. I was a nationally ranked runner. And then also, um, I attended a private school in high school that was entirely dedicated to ski racing. Cause I was trying to make the, um, U S national team first for Alpine skiing. Um, so I did do come from a pretty athletic background, but, um, when I got to college, I just, you know, I really wanted to embrace academia and just the college university experience. And I did compete in, um, while I was in school, but I, I everything athletically kind of took, um, kind of a backseat to what I was wanting to accomplish from school. And when I got out of school, I started working in finance and just went down a really bad <laughs> um, path from a health perspective. I, I, I was, I was working 100 hour weeks pretty regularly, sometimes more, um, sleeping under my desk a lot, and never worked out at all, and um, ended up starting to smoke pretty heavily and was smoking at one point about two packs a day. And um, I was out at a bar one night with my friends and one of my friends who had put on a lot of weight since school had said that he was, had signed up for this triathlon. And so, you know, we just started talking and one thing led to another and we ended up making a bet as to who could beat the other person. And so it was really just by chance that I ended up going and doing my first triathlon. I wasn't trying to do anything healthy for myself. I definitely, you know, didn't train for it at all. I just showed up and did it. And, um, it was, I mean, it was truly a life-changing moment for me. I just completely loved the experience and um, was really motivated by the community of people that um, were there participating in the event and just loved kind of being back and getting the adrenaline rush from um, doing something athletically good for myself. And um, so I quit smoking on the spot and started training a little bit. I went and bought a bike. And then I went and did another triathlon a few months later and ended up winning the race. And that was kind of the beginning of the end, I guess. It, it kind of got this idea in my head that, you know, maybe if I trained hard and got a coach, I could maybe go to the Olympics. Um, and so I just started, you know, training pretty seriously and, and having a go at it. Wow. So you, so you really went for it right from the start then. That 
that sort of growing up in the in the sports school bubble of being aiming for the Olympics, do you think that got inside your head as a young person? And because I know most people don't sort of think I've won my first race, I'm going to go to the Olympics. <laughs> that's that's a brilliant thing to shoot for, though. Yeah, I mean, I grew up um, running at a, a very very high level, and um, also of course with going to the ski academy, I was um, skiing at a really high level and my whole goal growing up and my whole dream was to go to the Olympics. And, um, I took both sports quite seriously from a very, very young age and also got burned out of them quite quickly. And so, you know, I had this really long, I had this dream of going to the Olympics and then I had this really long break from sport. And as soon as I came back and did my first triathlon, it was like all those competitive juices started flowing again. And, you know, I think kind of with anything in my life, I either go all in or I don't really do it at all. I mean, even with banking, right? Like my career choice was something that was like so brutal and was requiring so many hours and was so cutthroat. I mean, I think I just really thrive in that kind of environment. And so when I saw that I had a little bit of potential in triathlon or what I thought was potential, I just you know, completely latched onto that and suddenly had visions of the Olympics, like running through my head. <laughs> nice. Hey, do you know, it's an interesting point. It does seem like there are a lot of, certainly in, in the age group field, there are a lot of very good competitive age groupers who work in finance as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's something to do with that, that drive to compete that allows you to channel that into banking, but also you can channel it into sport as well. It's a very similar mindset, I guess. I think so. I mean, I think with banking, it's, um, it's very challenging in the sense that it's quite intense and you have to have a pretty thick skin and you can't be, you know, you can't have a lot of emotional highs and lows. You just have to stay really even keeled and you get a lot of negative feedback and you just have to absorb it and, you know, just keep going and, you know, chip away at getting better and better and better. And it actually reminds me a lot of Ironman racing and triathlon in general, where, you know, in, in an Ironman, there's so many things that go wrong. And if you allow yourself to get, um, you know, get beaten down by one thing that goes wrong, your race is over versus I think that, you know, with, you know, kind of with banking, you learn to be resilient and just sort of go with the flow and problem solve. And, um, you know, I, I don't know. I just think that there's a lot of, crossover and a lot of similarities and um they complement each other actually quite well yeah yeah it does definitely seem like it prepares you well for a sport where the feedback that you're getting is basically your body starts to hurt more and more the more the event yeah. goes on and you're just gonna keep yeah. on driving through it yeah for sure all right so the big the big race that really blew you back up onto the radar recently for us was the win at Ironman Brazil and mm -hmm. not just the win at Ironman Brazil, but the manner in which you won and your runtime. Mm -hmm. So will you talk us a little bit about your about your day there at Brazil, please? Sure. I had um, really it was the best career of my or best performance of my career. Um, it was really outstanding. Um, and so, you know, I had kind of a typical swim for myself it was a it was a, a decent swim I came out eight minutes eight and a half minutes back of um the lead female which you know for me anything under 10 minutes is is pretty decent and I knew that I was going to come out of the water behind and you know my goal for the day was just to try to get off the bike within four or five minutes of the lead because I felt like that would probably put me in shot of contention if I ran well um and I actually had done Ironman Brazil the year before. And part of the reason I came back to race there again was that I felt quite disappointed with how I rode my bike the prior year. And I felt like I could ride my bike really well in that course. And so I wanted to come back and, and give it a go again. But I got on my bike and I just started riding. And um, I went through the halfway point in about 220, which would put me on, on pace for four a 440, um, 180 K. And I was, you know, I just, I felt like totally racing within myself. I didn't feel like I was pushing myself really at all. I wasn't like pushing any crazy limits. I just was riding my bike and I happened to ride, be riding my bike really well. And, um, I ended up 
catching the lead female at about 120 kilometers on the bike, um, which was a huge surprise to me. But, you know, I was just going for it. And I kept thinking to myself, this is either going to end really badly or it's going to go really, really well. (laughs) Um, And I ended up, I I actually had happened to look at what the course record um, bike split was a couple days before. And when I got off the bike, I knew that I had broken the course record. And so I got off the bike with, you know, quite excited about how I had ridden and really it had just exceeded my expectations in terms of what I had hoped to do um, in terms of where I would get off the bike within the race. And then also what my time was. And I got off and I thought, okay, well, I'll just, you know, I'll see what I can do on the run. But, but I, I will say I went into the run wanting to break the run course record. Um, I've, I've done a number of runs under three hours at this point, And the run course record was 256. It was held by a woman who was um, a couple years later um, found she, she was using EPO. And so she was, you know, she's been banned from she's the sport. Popped, yeah. So I was really motivated to break the run course record because I just, you know, I didn't like that this girl who had done EPO was the run course record holder. And so I went out at a pretty strong pace. And um, literally, I just went out and I was like, I'm going to run this pace for as long as I can and see what happens. And and I pretty much held it for the, I went through the half in 125 um, and then I ended up running the second half in 127. So I was a little bit slower. Usually I'm a, a little bit more evenly paced on my, on my runs, but, um, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was one of those days where everything just came together and I never felt like I was fighting it. I just was kind of going with the flow and, you know, even on the run, when I started to hurt, my run times weren't really falling off that much. And, um, with about a mile to go, I hadn't really put, I hadn't really put it all together to realize what my final time was going to be. But this motorcycle pulled up next to me. It was a race official. And he said, you know, just so you know, you're running for the record. And I said, is it close? And he said, yeah, it's close. And so I just ran so hard for the last mile because I really wanted to get the overall course record. And as it turned out, I was well under the course record. I beat it by 12 minutes. Um, (laughs) So, but it was just, it was a really incredible feeling for me. Um, I, I was, I had a really bad year last year. I was really burned out. I just wasn't really enjoying training and racing that much. Um, I had questioned whether or not I really wanted to continue and into this year because I was, I was that unhappy and I took a really, really big break at the end of the year and, um, just honestly have been loving training and racing again this year. And so I think the biggest thing for me coming into the finish line was more just like the joy of the whole experience for me. You know, I'd had this really fantastic race and I had met all these great goals of mine that I had set and it was done in a way that, you know, I was really just, I was, I was loving it. And so it was a really exciting um, moment for me. And, and also kind of, I think, indicative of what people I say, which is, you know, when you, when you take the pressure off yourself and you take a step back and sometimes allow yourself to rest, that's when the great performances come and that's what happened. You know, it's super interesting that you've said that because I interviewed, um, Brian Fogarty, who won Ironman UK a couple of days ago. Um, mm-hmm. it won't be a couple of days ago by the time listeners hear this, but anyway, um, yeah. and, and he was saying a similar thing. He, he was saying he ended up taking a big break from training because of an injury in the birth of his first child. And he was really like, Oh, what's it going to be like when I come back to training? But he really feels as well, like the break from training was the thing that lit the fire under him again. And when he came back, he had a new daughter. He had other things going on. But he said that break was something I hadn't had for years. And it really was, it's like the thing we all know, but never do. Take a break. And actually, it's the peaks and troughs of the year that help you build year on year. It's not the constant kind of hammering yourself all through the winter. We need that break, don't we? I mean, for sure. And and I give my coach, Matt Dixon from Purple Patch Fitness, a a lot of credit for that. Um, we sat down at the end of the year and I, 
you know, was very open with him about how burned out I was feeling. And he said to me, you need to take a really big break. And so I took, I mean, I was at a point where that's what I wanted to. And so I didn't really fight it, but the way that he guided me back into fitness was just really spectacular. I mean, I took, I took some serious time off about really about four weeks, but all of January, all of February and all of March, my training volume, I was training like 10 to 12 hours less a week than, or even maybe even more than I normally was that time of year. It it probably was even closer to 15 hours less. So my training volume was quite a bit lower and there was just a lot more flexibility in what I was doing. He wasn't giving me any really long rides. And I think that that, um, I don't know. He, I think he just did such a good job of sort of, you know, keeping me going, but not in a way that it was allowing my body to continue to rest. Yeah. And I, and I honestly can tell you there was this period, like all of January, all of February, all of March, I was feeling the same way. My body was feeling tired. I was, you know, not in a good mood. I was just not enjoying the process. I mean, it was like, I kind of felt like I was slogging along And then suddenly there was one day I woke up and I woke up in the morning and I thought I'm ready to go. And I went out and I started riding my bike and it was like, it was literally like a light switch came on and I started enjoying it again. And, and also even this year with my races, every race, it's just been, let's just go see what I can do. You know, like, I don't know what's going to happen, but let's just see what happened. You know, what I, what, what's possible. There hasn't been this huge pressure on myself to, you know, do one thing or another. I just, I'm really just getting out there and trying to race for myself and, and see what, see what I can do. It's been fun. Do you think that having put the performance out that you did at Brazil, has that kind of taken the pressure off yourself mentally a bit? The fact that you've now gone, well, do you know what? I think everyone lives with that kind of, if everything went right, I think I could do this kind of performance. And I mean, that's it, isn't it? Brazil's right there. It's like, if everything goes right, let's go through these splits. It was a, it was a 58 swim. Then you rode 443, which was 15 minutes faster than the nearest lady. And then you ran a 253.18. And to put that in context, context for the listeners, that was 20 seconds faster than the men's winner, Andy Potts. <laughs> it was about 30 seconds slower than Will Clark in second place. Now, I'm, I'm, I don't want to make this like a male female thing, but yeah. there's traditionally like a difference between the two sexes. Yeah. You would have, you would have like taken those guys down in a head to head race that day. <laughs> That's just, it's mind blowing. I think there was only one guy ran a, a minute or so faster, but yeah, I, I'm staggered by it. I looked at the results and I was just like, we have to get her back on because it's just such an amazing run performance that, and and it's great, you know, you want to break the course record. There's that girl who's been naughty and done EPO. Yeah. And you want to take it back off. Yeah. And that's great. But it sounds like the key thing that was different for you was like this mindset of having no pressure and just seeing what you can do and having fun with it. I think for sure. And, and also, um, you know, I've always run pretty, I would, I don't want to say conservatively, but I've always run pretty conservatively in Ironman where like I've never blown up and um I should try that that's really fun (laughs) yeah (laughs) well I mean it's funny I've like really never blown up but I've always known that I can I've always relied on my run so I think I've been hesitant to really push myself and push my limits on the run um because I know that even if I run fairly conservatively I'll still run faster than most people. And the night before the race, my husband said to me, I said, I, I think I want to run this pace for the first 18 miles, but I don't know. I'm afraid that I'm going to blow up. And he said, Sarah, have you ever blown up in a race before? And I said, no. And he said, exactly. Just do it. And he really is the one that gave me the confidence. And also I think, like you said, it's just, I don't know, taking on this mindset of like, whatever. I'm just going to go for it and see what happens. And it's been quite liberating for me because I don't want to say that I don't care because of course I do do care quite a bit about how I do, but 
um, I'm, I'm for whatever reason, like I'm suddenly much more willing to just to take chances and, um, give it a go and, and see what can happen. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been cool. And now that I've run 253, I'm like quite interested to see if I can go even faster than that. And I will say that, um, one of my goals here at Ironman Hamburg is to see if I could run under 250. Oh, awesome. I was going to say, is it going to be a 240 something? That's because Hamburg's a fast course, isn't it? It's, it's renowned. It's for being a fast a course. course. And, and I mean, if you look at the women's well. time, yeah, if you look at the women's times there, they haven't historically been that fast, but the men's times are, are quite fast. Um, so, you know, we'll see. I'm, I'm going to go for it. You know, I'm kind of going to take the same approach, but a little bit faster this time. Like I'm going to set a pace for the first 18 miles and just do it. Hope that I can hang on. <laughs> yeah. Cause there can't be, there can't be many other women. I don't know the facts, but I know Chrissy ran in the two forties. Has, has anyone ever run in the two forties apart from her? There's two women that have run, um, in the two forties. Well, Christy ran two forties at challenge Roth yeah. wrote. Um, I don't know at that point in time, if the course there was, it was rumored that the course was short. And then, um, Kristen Moeller, who's now named Kristen Leopold. She ran two forty one like years ago, like 2009 or eight or seven in, uh, at Ironman UK. Yeah. But again, I, it's to me a 241 is like mind blowing. Like I just can't imagine she's a very fast runner and like yeah. she's run some really spectacular times, but I just can't imagine that. I, I think the course um, was, the course was a bit short that year. That being said though, her split was right up there with the leading men as well. So it was like that confluence of a shorter yeah. course, but also like, like you said, you know, hats off to it, it was still an absolutely i was on course that day and we were all just like she cannot be running that speed for the whole marathon yeah. surely it was just <laughs> like watching someone in a 10k you know it yeah. was it was incredible okay yeah. so, right, i mean so her her time is is so fast but you know i definitely think that if i were able to do it um here it would be the first time in you yeah. know a long time that somebody's done that so who knows Fantastic. maybe it yeah. will happen maybe it won't but i'm just gonna go for it and see what happens <laughs> well something i've always loved about you is that you've always you always put that run out at the end like a it was kona last year you ran i've got the facts here in front of me you ran 259 at kona when only a couple of other people went under three hours mm -hmm. and you ran yourself up into 11th place and the athletes around you you were sort of 15 to 20 minutes faster than their run time so yeah. I really love that you just you just lay it all out on the run every every time. It's like a full gas effort, isn't it? Sort of, yeah. I mean, like I said, I mean, I think historically I've always known that I can run faster than most people. So it's and also I think if you ever look at my times, like my marathon splits are I either negative split them or they're like pretty evenly paced. So. I think I really rely on, you know, I definitely rely on my run to put me in a better position in the race. And so I think that I've always, like I said, been a little bit hesitant to really put myself out there and see, see what's possible just because I don't know, like I'm afraid of blowing up and, and ruining my race, but, just, but at this point I'm just doing it. Love it. Is your approach going to change on the bike now, having having seen how fast you can ride? Because obviously, looking at the differential between you and the lead men at Brazil, you were only 20 minutes down. It wasn't like the pro men rode 403, they rode 423. Mm -hmm. So you're only 20 minutes down there. If you extrapolate that to Kona, and I know it's like it's a big ask, but say like the top men there are riding 408, 409, and the lead women are at Daniela Roda 426. Lucy rode mm -hmm. a 438. So again, it's 20 minutes to Daniela. It's 30 minutes to Lucy. So maybe there's another, maybe there's another 15 minutes off your bike split at Kona. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, it, it's been such a, it's honestly just been such a, an interesting year for me in yeah. general, particularly on the bike. Um, like I said, I, you know, last year I felt like I just was, totally missing the mark on the bike and I just wasn't biking well 
and this year, I don't know, like every bike I've done has been really great this year. And, you know, I think I go in with a little bit of trepida- trepidation and, and actually a, a little bit of a lack of confidence because um, I didn't bike well all year last year. And so I think I go into every race being like, Oh, is it going to happen today? But every race so far, it's just showed up. I mean, even last weekend and, um, in Astana, I outrode Radka Caldfelt, who's a amazing 70.3 athlete by like seven minutes or six minutes or something like that. Like I, was so shocked. You rode like I... two two ten, was it? I saw. I've been two eleven. Two eleven. 11. Yeah. <laughs> That's unbelievable. I mean, I've been like surprising myself with my bikes. Yeah. My bike times recently, like I, it's been really crazy, and so, um, you know, I'm just going into the race at Hamburg, kind of with a similar approach of just, okay, well, let's just see what can happen and see what I can do, and I'll definitely try and probably hold a slightly higher wattage than I held in, in Brazil, but, um, I don't know. My approach in Brazil seemed to work pretty well. So I don't know <laughs> if I want to mess with it. And, and I definitely really want to run well. Yeah. Hey, well, even if you ride at the same wattage on a similar kind of course, it's still going to be a, a scorching 440 bike time. It, I pity anyone who has to line up and race you. That's it's terrifying. What a combo. <laughs> Well, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a actually quite a strong field racing Hamburg. Um, there's, if everybody shows up, there's, uh, six women that are already Kona qualifiers. So Caroline Steffen, Susie Cheatham, myself, Maureen Hoof, Kristen Leopold, and, um, Bianca Sturr, I think. Yeah. But, so it's a, it's a, and then the Corinne Abraham, who's a fantastic yeah, Ironman yeah. athlete and Sarah Lewis, who's never done Ironman, but she's a great 70.3 athlete and can run. And I mean, there's quite a few athletes that, um, you know, are going to be racing that will make it a really interesting race and are very strong. So we'll see. And I can I see in your I, eyes. I hope my bike shows up. <laughs> You you love that though. I can see just looking at you that like your face is lighting up as you're talking about the people you get to race. That's it for you, isn't it? It's racing people. Bring them on and and be competitive. I really enjoy doing um, races with um, going against people that will make it wonderful, like a wonderful race and wonderful competition. Um, you know, last weekend in Astana, I got to race Radka and. I mean, to be totally honest with you, I didn't really expect that I was going to be able to beat her, particularly coming off of racing in Ecuador the weekend before. But it was like such a pleasure for me to just be able to line up with her. And then she and I actually got off the bike together um, and we started the run together. And, you know, that was just to me, that was so great. And I, I wish that I had, um, my, I hadn't been as fatigued as I was. I was quite tired from the travel and racing the weekend before. Cause it, you know, for me to be able to race against such a, a wonderful 70.3 athlete and potentially, you know, really have a good foot race with her was, was exciting for me. So I don't know. It's just, it's fun when there's good people racing, you know, like it makes it a lot more satisfying when you get across the finish line and you feel like you really pushed yourself and, um, push yourself in a different way than when it's just kind of when you have like a 15 minute lead or something like that, you know, (laughs) not that you get told you've got a 15 minute lead because they lie to you and tell you (laughs) you're racing for the record. (laughs) Yeah. Hey, well, listen, one thing I wanted to talk to you about, we we talked a little bit about this, um, off air was, um, I've been really interested reading your blog about working. You've been working with a nutritionist and different changes that you've made in your diet and your nutrition to sort of support, you know, you alluded to the fact it was a, a pretty rough year for you last year and you made some dietary changes. So would you talk through a little bit through that for us, the changes that you made and how you feel that's affected you? Sure. Um, so at the beginning of last year, I started working with, um, well, I started working with one person and two companies, um, which I think that have actually had just a big impact on me in terms of like how I've approached my training and racing and and nutrition and everything. But, um, specifically on the nutrition side, I started working with a company called Excella wellness, which, um, they monitor gut health and, um, 
coinciding with them, I started working with uh, uh, Scott Tyndall, who's a um, nutritionist that has done a lot of work with uh, the America's Cup um, sailing teams. And he most recently was working with the Toronto Maple Leafs and just has done a lot of um, nutrition for high-end sports performers. Okay. And, um, you know, one of the issues I had was just a lot, like for me, after races, I would swell like crazy to the point that I, some, at some races or after some races, I would retain up to 10 kilos of water weight after a race. I mean, it was just crazy. Wow. And I'd have this awful bloating and it would take me like a month to feel better and recover. And the bloating would never really go away. And I had a lot of disrupted sleep and there was just like just a lot of issues that I had going on that I felt like, for example, when you have that kind of swelling or if you have a lot of stomach bloating or, you know, anything like that, it, it impacts how you're able to engage your core. And then if I can't engage my core, I'm, you know, not able to train or, you know, my run stride gets impacted. And then when my run stride, run stride gets impacted, I'm more likely to get injured. I mean, there's just all these things. And so, um, I did a bunch of gut health testing with Excella and um, all of the results came back saying that my gastrointestinal fitness was really poor and that my, you know, it was throwing off all the things related to like my sleep and all these other things. And so working with Scott, we ended up having me, um, he said, identified that I had um, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, um, and he put me on a low FODMAP diet which, um, I hate to use the word diet cause it's, it's not really a diet. It's just that, um, certain foods contain, um, various levels of fructose or fructans, which can really irritate your system and have a negative impact on your gut and irritate your gut. And so I had to remove certain, certain foods and in doing so almost like within a week, like the swelling went away and the bloating went away and my sleep improved. Wow. And I mean, it's been like, it was like totally crazy. And I think it's taken really almost, it took me about a year to, until I really started feeling really better and then starting to be able to like reintroduce certain foods into my diet and be able to tolerate them. But, um, over time I kept doing the gut, health testing with Excel and, and we could just see my gut health improving, improving, improving. And with that, things like my sleep improved. My th- I have um I have Hashimoto's, which is an autoimmune disorder that impacts my thyroid. And for the first time in probably five or six years, my thyroid stabilized, which has not happened in so long. So, you know, my thyroid levels were normal, my sleep was improving, the bloating I was ha- experiencing just completely went away. Um, now when I travel or after races, I may retain like, I don't know, a kilo or so of water weight, but not the like 10 kilos that I was experiencing before. Um, and I think as a result, I've like had much fewer injuries. Like one of the things I've always struggled with is an issue with my Achilles And that typically flares up after races. And I think that was because I was having so much inflammation. It was impacting, having an impact on my Achilles. And I haven't had any issues with that this year. So there's just been like, you know, it's just kind of been this circular positive um, impact. And Scott has been just absolutely fantastic to work with. And um, he actually looks at my training plan every week and also goes in and um, essentially on a day-to-day basis tells me how many grams of carbohydrate, fat, and protein I'm supposed to be eating. Um, and particularly around heavy training sessions, he'll say, okay, this is supposed to be like a high carbohydrate meal, or you need to make sure that you have a protein shake on this night before you go to bed. So he's really been helping and facilitating, um, around my recovery and making sure that I'm eating to recover and eating to set myself up for performance the next day. And so, um, you know, and the conjunction of the two of them has been great. And then, um, at the same time, I've been working with a company called CircaCore, which they make a device that monitors, 
um, non-invasively monitors your hemoglobin levels and then also like your pulse rate and oxygen saturation and hydration levels and um, your pulse rate variability or heart rate variability. And monitoring that around my recovery and particularly coming out of last year where I was so tired and, and really burned out and quite run down. Um, I think the combination of the nutritional changes I've made with being able to monitor my recovery and hydration levels um, more closely has just been, I think, game changing for me in terms of um, just having a, a overall better sense of, you know, what my body's telling me and then B just being able to um, feed myself the right foods to be able to recover properly and like actually be able to absorb the nutrients and, um, you know, use it to my benefit versus like fighting my body, which has been great. Yeah. It's, it's much more of a, like I said, that as I've read through your blog, there's much more of a mindset of like feeding your body, the nutrients it can absorb rather than like a, restricting the amount of calories you can have for performance kind of mindset, isn't it? It seems like a big shift has taken place there for you. Totally. And I mean, that's like been one of the great things in working with Scott is I think that a lot of athletes are, are quite restrictive with what they eat. And Scott's encouraged me to essentially eat, well, eat a lot of food, but like, do it in a thoughtful way, you know, around my training loads, but also, you know, not just eat the same thing. Like you have to eat a variety of foods and you want to be eating things that are going to nourish you. And so it's been like, it's almost brought the fun back into, into eating because it's really, you know, it's been just, it's been so wonderful to cook beautiful foods and things that taste really good. And are full of nourishment and feel like it's you know i'm not restricting myself which is great awesome all right so listen we need to wrap this up because i know you're busy and you've got to go and, and prepare for a next training session um let me end on this one you've got hamburg coming up it will already have mm -hmm. happened by the time this goes out so what's the plan for the rest of your year other than eating delicious food <laughs> absorbing yeah. amazing training and and putting out hellish bike splits on the competition and run splits <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um well, after Hamburg, I'm going to take uh, kind of a, a little break. My husband's actually coming um, coming to Germany in a few days to join me, and we're going to take a few days and um, travel around a little bit. And then from there, I'll start getting ready for Kona. Um, I have a couple races lined up. I haven't quite decided which ones I'm going to do yet, but um, they'll be based in the United States, just kind of mostly to facilitate my Kona prep. Um, and then I'll be going actually to Kansas, which is where I've done Kona, my Kona preps in the past. Um, I'll probably go there for about three weeks or four weeks to do, uh, to do a big training block and get ready for Kona. So, and then awesome. after that, I, I just committed to doing a race in Chile the week after Kona. So I'll be flying down there. Um, but the rest <laughs> of my season after that's a little bit up in the air fantastic crazy travel schedule be damned right yeah well, <laughs> you know the other thing i feel like is um we only have we only live once and there are so many incredible places in the world to visit and why not take the opportunity to go and and visit them and and ride your bike in these like phenomenal places and run everywhere so it's fun to travel around love it i'm going to make a note of that we only live once <laughs> all right brilliant listen thank you so much for taking the time to come back on the show I wish you all the best for the uh for the race in hamburg bizarrely we'll know the result of that by the time this goes live so fingers crossed that run's got a 240x in it hey and then then it's just a matter of doing it in kona that's right 249.9 249.59.9 yeah that'll Be do great <laughs> fantastic all right so thanks very much all right thanks I love how she wraps that up, Hells. We only live once. It is so true, Rob. It is so true. And I tell my, I've told myself that a lot over the past few years. You're never gonna you're never gonna regret having volunteered and being enthusiastic in the rain, Hells. No. Perhaps making <laughs> no, it onto YouTube on some random Germans. Oh don't, YouTube honestly. Channel. 
Fifty thousand steps apparently yesterday is what I clocked up. Is that right? Yeah, that's I, I, like, incredible. That's like well, five times what a sedentary person do, aims for in a day, isn't it? I know. So <laughs> I was a little bit tired last night. I think though, you know, if you so I had like a clapper thing, a, I don't know, shaker thing in my hand. Yeah. So I think that will have added quite a few on. Um, I think we need to try it, and find this video and put it out on the away podcast. Oh, honestly, I don't. I just was like, I was an absolute loon. Genuinely, competitors, a few competitors came up to me and gave me a hug on their last lap, their last run lap, because oh, I've been supporting. so encouraging. Love it. <laughs> you're a legend, Hells. Oh, God. Even when you're not racing, what? you're a legend. What a state. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My poor husband. Oh, bless. It must be a bit embarrassing, though, mustn't it? No, I think it's awesome. He knew what he was getting into. It's not like you well, mutated he wasn't, into this he wasn't near me. No, <laughs> but someone did say, um, someone did say they could hear me on the other side of the key. That's quality. <laughs> That's some quality supporting <laughs> right there. Oh, yeah, watch brill. out! I am on Wales. Anyone there? Well, anyone there? there you go. Retreat. I think we need we need to put it out there to the listeners and their families to try and get video clips of you supporting Wales and get it on the Twitter feed. Oh no. <laughs> honestly it's out there now hell so you can't undo it all right listen let's do uh we've got a couple of bits of news before we wrap today's show up haven't we sponsored by precision hydration um remember if you are racing in the heat which doesn't seem likely today given the weather yesterday (laughs) but regardless your body needs electrolytes and hydration and electrolytes are the key to staying hydrated it's all about the balance of those electrolytes keeping the right amount of fluid in your body so when you're sweating the electrolytes go out with the water and you lose the water to lose the heat, but then you need the electrolytes in your body to keep those muscles contracting and firing properly. So precision hydration make electrolytes in different strengths to match how you sweat. You can go to their website and take their online sweat test, and that'll give you a really good, just simple answer, a few questions, and it'll give you a lead as to whether you're a very heavy sweater, which you probably know anyway, because your, your clothes will be soaked. But what you can't tell from that is whether you're a very salty sweater. So if you are... Keeping that salt and electrolyte balance is really key to having a good race. So go over to precisionhydration.com and remember on their website, if you've not tried it yet, you can use the code Oxygen Addict to get £9.99 worth of free product to give it a try. So a couple of bits of news that we've seen. The first one is we've talked about the Castle to Coast Sportive Triathlon a couple of times, haven't we, that's taken place down at Eton Dorney Lake in, I think it's the 10th of August from memory. That's it. And so they've only got, they've got less than 50 places left now. And you swim in well, um, Eton Dorney. Yeah. And then you bike um, down towards the south coast and you finish it with a run to Brighton. And that's where, you know, the finish party is and things like that. So it's a cool idea, I think, like a for a sort of sportive triathlon. triathlon. Yeah. Um, so if you are interested in doing that, it's being run by full steam events so you'll be able to find it with a little bit of googling the castle to coast sportive triathlon a week on saturday and there are less than 50 entries left and the other bit of news that i've seen that isn't isn't directly triathlon related but do you remember we had dan bigham on um, yes. talking about you know aerodynamics and how to make yourself faster on the bike a while back and he's part of the hoob what bike um, track racing team and yes. it looks like the UCI have just announced it's really bad news for them there's going to be no trade teams allowed in anymore as well as announcing that the track is now going to be summer racing rather than winter racing so effectively what this means is especially for the women um you now got to make a choice you're either a track rider or you're a road rider so Dan made this really good point in the interview I read with him that for a lot of the women, it's how they make their living. You know, they race on the track yeah. in the winter and then the race, yep. it's not so much for the men because it's a much more developed and moneyed sport, but really bizarre rule change by the UCI. Yeah, I remember the likes of um, Danny King would have done yeah. a, a lot of track and then, you know, road and then a lot of them when the team Wiggle first came out as well. So um, your likes of Laura Kenny and Joanna Rousel Shand, they were all in that team wiggle and so did you know the the women's tour and things like that but clearly were very much 
team GB track cyclists as well. But yeah, they they did. They could then go and, and improve on the road and things like that. And yeah, that seems really crazy. Mm, not good. Not happy. Feel bad for them. Not good that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we've pretty much got to the end of our episode here then, Hal. So let's wrap this up. Next week, we are going to have, um, we've had a couple of requests for one of these, actually. We've put together a an over an hour long hydration special. So if you've been racing in the heat, you're going to be racing in the heat. You've been training in the crazy hot weather recently and you want to know basically everything that we did on bike fit and aerodynamics with Matt Botterill. We've got Andy Blow, the founder of Precision Hydration on. So there's probably nobody in the world knows more about hydration than he does. So we've got an hour long hydration special with them up next week. Um, you're not going to, you're going to have to wait to find out what happens on my peak district run. Yes. Is that next weekend? Yeah, so it's on Saturday. Yeah. Oh, best of luck with Six that. Six days away. Oh my goodness. How are you feeling ahead of that? Um, if you had asked me two weeks ago, I would have said I really don't know if I'll make the cutoffs. Um, I went out last Saturday, so over a week ago now, and actually had a better time. And I didn't spend nearly all of the route map reading, and that made a big difference. So, yeah, okay. I'm more confident that I hopefully can get around hopefully it's hard Not, navigating you know, up there isn't it the peaks it's a place yeah, where a lot of people a lot get lost you've got to know your map up there it's a lot of open moorland yeah. and um yeah but it, i'm i am looking forward to it i am looking forward to it but well, uh, yeah nervous too best of luck to you we look forward to finding out in two weeks time how you get on hells thanks good stuff all right everyone listen thank you very much for listening it was great to meet so many of you at the outlaw this weekend uh keep up the good work if you manage to finish outlaw in those conditions hats off to you well done and hopefully we'll see loads more of you at outlaw x on the 22nd 23rd of september um till next week we're brought to you by our sponsors foodcell.co.uk precisionhydration.com and teamoxygenetic.com i'm coach rob Wilby. I'm Helen Murray. And you've been listening to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. Have a fantastic, safe training and racing week, everybody. And we'll speak to you all again soon. Cheers, Helen. See ya.